hi everybody. Jason Key and SP Grid, Harvard Medical School in Boston. Thanks for joining. I'll go ahead and introduce Pavel Afanin. So Pavel is at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And this is um, uh, the second webinar that Pavel's given us. So uh, in his last, uh, his last webinar, we talked a little bit about uh, atomic model validation and map validation. And Pavel mentioned that that's enough that it could be the subject of an entire webinar. So uh, we were able to twist his arm a little and get an entire another webinar from him. So Pavel, are you there? Hi, uh, thanks for a nice introduction. And hello everybody. Um, yeah, so today's topic is um, validation. And actually, I apologize for the last minute change. Um, so originally I thought I'd talk about atomic model map and model to map validation. And I realized that's the huge topic to talk about all in one go. So today we're going to talk about atomic model validation alone. And if uh, occasion arises, I can talk more about map and model to map fit validation. All right, let's get started. Right, so um, I'm coming from Phoenix. I'm a Phoenix developer for uh, the past um, 17 years, and that's what Phoenix is. So I'm going to talk about validation in general, but actually focusing on what we actually have in Phoenix to do validation. And for those who don't know, Phoenix is a collaborator, is a software uh, suite for crystallography, cryom, and, and similar uh, techniques. And it's a collaboration between, um, between multiple uh, groups across, across the world, uh, us at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Randy Reed, and co-workers in Cambridge, UK, uh, people at Duke University, and Tom Terwilliger and Lee Wei, um, from uh, Los Alamos. All right, um, just to put things into uh, context, um, here's, um, here's a flow chart, comparison flow chart of um, structure solution workflows uh, in uh, X-ray crystallography, Newton crystallography versus cryam. And as you can see, they're very similar conceptually Right, so we all start, both start with data, then get an initial map one way or another, with the big difference is that in crystallography we don't have, um, we don't have phases, so the uh, extra, extra pain, extra steps to, to get phases, so you get a map. But once you got a map, you try to improve that map as good as you can, then you build atomic model into that map. You refine atomic model, meaning you make your atomic model as good as possible, so it fits um, the data as good as possible. And once you've got your final structure atomic model, you make sure it actually makes sense in, in many senses. It fits the data, the model itself is um, sane, and, and, and so on. And that's what we call um, essentially validation. And as you see, validation is common to um, both techniques. And so validation is the topic of uh, today's uh, presentation. Now, um, I will be more inclined towards CRYM uh, and validation in terms of CRYM uh, data and, 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 and models we, we use pens. So again, to put things even more into context, that's, that's, that's what we have in Phoenix to solve cryon structure, just starting from initial map, you can improve map, you do all the steps necessary to get your best map and initial model so that you refine it and you do validation. So we we'll talk about validation today. Um, so I mentioned validation a lot since I started. So what is validation actually? Um, well, validation is basically checking that your model data and model to data fit all make sense all together. That's, that's, really, that's really a high level picture of what validation is, right? And by data, I mean crystallographic data, so diffraction data or cryon data, which is two dimensional, three dimensional constructions or oh, three-dimensional reconstruct, two-dimensional images or three-dimensional reconstruction. <clears throat> right, so 
I realize many of us doing crystallography and cryam, some people do more crystallography than cryam and versa versa, then um, really you may ask a question, what's the, what's the difference, what's the difference between validation in two different, in, in these two contexts, crystallography versus cryam? Well, um, there's essentially no difference when, you, when it comes to validating your atomic model. So crystallography versus cryam, when you validate your atomic model, the validation techniques and tools, everything stays the same. Uh, obviously, when it comes to data, there's a big difference, right? So in cryam, your data is three-dimensional reconstruction. It's a map with amplitudes and phases coming from our experiment in crystallography. Um, your data are diffraction images or processed and merged in intensities. So the nature of different of data different. So there are different techniques and tools to do uh, validation. When it comes to model to data fit uh, validation, there are similarities and dissimilarities in um, both techniques. Example, uh, there is no R factors. There's no R warp and R free in cryam. That's the difference, that's a big difference. On the other hand, you can, both techniques give you a map that you interpret in terms of atomic model. So you can calculate the correlation between your atomic model, or strictly speaking, between your uh, model calculated map and experimental map. So in this way, there's two, um, similar so there's no r factors but you can always compare your atomic model against the map and maps you get in uh, both techniques now um so why bother why why do we want to do validation why why, why it's important and here i'm just showing very obvious reasons uh for for doing this so validation can save you a lot of time for example in case of crystallography if you get you know, something like unsolvable tweening, you may spend months trying to solve your structure against the data that is not really solvable. So, but if you know that beforehand, you know, that can, self, that can save you a lot of time. In CRIAM, I've seen cases where users would have a map that by some accident became a very poor map, you know, some, something happened to that map. And I've seen people trying to build and fit atomic models in those maps where, you know, map doesn't really make sense. So if you know that beforehand, and you know that from, by doing validation, that can save you a lot of time, right? Uh, another reason is subjectivity. So uh, all these procedures involve a lot of steps, computational steps, manual steps, and all the mixtures of both. So we manually interpret our data and that the result of that depends on our skills, pressure, experience. There might be a difference between somebody who just started doing, who just entered the field or somebody who's been doing this for, for years. So um, there's a whole lot of different ways how we parameterize our procedures, models and refinements. There are lots of parameters. Phoenix Define alone has more than a thousand parameters to tweak with. So, and all of that affects the final result. And the data we get, uh, it's always never perfect, right? So it, it's always of finite resolution. So that gives rise of multiple interpretation of this data. So if you, for example, if you got um, low resolution data, there, are there may be multiple ways how you interpret that data in terms of atomic model. So there's uncertainty here. Now, uh, uh, well, humans, we program software and you guys do uh, solve your structures. So programs may have bugs. We do fix them, but we do introduce another ones as we add more features. So that's kind of a constant circle. You need to keep that in mind. Uh, there are things like uh, you got your final structure and you're ready to deposit it and you look at it good and realize, oh, I don't like that water. Why don't I delete it and then deposit my structure? And that's the biggest mistake you can do because one of the biggest mistakes you can do because um, by doing so, you invalidate 
all the statistics you report for your structure that you're about to deposit, like number of atoms, R factors or correlations, and, and so on. And there are a whole lot of different things you can do to your model as you thinking that it's really minor, that's not going to change anything, but actually that changes your model. And that's not a problem you can introduce. Um, there are other things such as misusing quality metrics, um, judging about waters based on R factors and, and such, but uh, we can talk more about it uh, later if there are questions. Um, so again, the bottom line is validation helps you to save time, produce better models and set correct expectations. So you know, if you have a high resolution data, if you have a usual resolution data like transform or something, you know pretty much how much time you're gonna spend. If you have very high resolution data, ultra high resolution data in case of uh, crystallography, something like one angstrom or better, then you know you're going to see a lot of details in your map and that's going to take you a lot of effort to model these details. So you have your expectation right here. Or if you have low resolution data, very low resolution data, three, four, five, then you know your map is not going to be very detailed and you're going to have a hard time placing atomic model into that map, right? So validation helps you to set correct expectations. And yeah, important, it, it helps you to avoid honest mistakes or community catch uh, frauds. Um, and in terms of tools in Phoenix, we recently, I mean, a couple of years ago now, um, we really realized that CRIM is really becoming more mainstream. So we spent a lot of time trying to um, summarize and look all the validation metrics that are out there that crystallography community built over decades and see what of those tools we can reuse and adapt for CRIM and what is needed to, what, what else we need to invent that is missing in crystallography that is specific to CRIAM. So the summary of that is published in this paper. So I'm not, I'm not going to have time to talk about all of these tools, but most of them are actually described in um, this, this paper. And so, yeah, going back to uh, mistakes in fraud, that's real, so some people think why that happens and whether that happens, and really that, 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 that happens. Um, despite all the quality filters we have, right? So if you do an honest job, you are uh, your first quality filter, then you know, there's a software that tries to guard you, but we can't really predict everything you do in, in software. So you have your boss to look at your results, you have reviewers when you publish your paper, you have PDB teams to, to validate whatever you deposit, you have community to look at your data. So all of these quality filters, but still um, it happens, really does, and noticed problems uh, sneak into our final, final structures that gets out there, but they, you know, be sure they, they likely they're discovered anyway, sooner or later. And just just to give you a hint, that happens. So that, I'm not going to go into details, but I was part of uh, looking at this, uh, you know, fabricated results, and that, that does happen. And in this particular case, you know, proper validation could could spot that immediately, but at that time, that wasn't available at, at the whole capacity. Okay. Um, so that's all important to realize that that sets the scene and the background. So to do validation, I mean, practically, we, we got tools in Phoenix, but a lot of tools in Phoenix, in fact, um, for data, basically crystallographic data, x triage, that's the, that's the main thing to do, or m triage, it's analog for, for CRIM, so, x triage analyzes crystallographic data, m triage analyzes your CRIAM data, three-dimensional construction map. There are tools to analyze um, model and model to data feed. 
It's on the validation tab in Phoenix graphical user interface. Again, there's a difference between um, the dedicated tools for CRIM and crystallography. There are more tools, more specific tools like structure comparisons, CC stars, and so on. I don't really have time to talk about this in particular, but just to give you hints, there are a lot of tools in, um, in, in Phoenix to do, um, to do validation. And again, uh, just two major things to remember, X-triage for X-ray data, M-triage for CRIM data, and comprehensive validation, two versions for CRIM and crystallography. That's what you need to run pretty much all the time when you, when you solve your structure. Okay, as I said today, we're going to talk, in the interest of time, we're going to talk about model validation only. And again, if occasion arises, we can talk more about data and model to data fit. Okay, uh, model validation. So actually, we said a lot, it's important, we need to do it, and, and so on and so on. But actually, how do we do this? How we approach, how, how we do model validation? Um, so if I show you a model um, and ask, is it a good model? How you tell it's a good model, a bad model, or so-so model, Right, so uh, looks like a model right on, on the screen. So put some atoms and side chains and, and so on. But there are two ways to approach this. So one is graphical, visual, and the other one is numeric. So the graphical tools that can annotate your atomic model in terms of problems, I'll show you in a second. And there are numeric ways that can calculate a number, some number that would measure some property of your model, and there would be some expectations about this number that you can look and judge whether your model is good or not. So in this particular case, speaking of visual uh, validation, we can show all the clashes. That's the kinematch picture from more property, which we also have in Phoenix. And all of a sudden you realize, wow, that's a lot of clashes. It's probably not a great model, a lot of clashes here. Same example here, we have a model. How you know it's a good model? Well, graphically, for example, there are many more similar tools, but for example, you can get a Rami channel plot for this particular model and realize, wow, that's pretty odd looking Rami channel plot. It's very unlikely plot. In fact, so that tells you something about, um, about model quality. Now specifically, um, and again, that's not a complete list, um, but kind of uh, items from our uh, table one um, thing that we all include in structural papers, that's what, that's what we look mainly. There are more to look at, but this, this, this is the list what we, kind of constantly look as we solve our structure. And I'll briefly go through some of um, items mentioned in, in this uh, table. Um, covalent geometry, that's pretty obvious. I'm pretty sure everybody knows just for the sake of complex, com uh, completeness I mentioned. So basically here we look at covalent geometry, bond lengths and angles, and also planes and torsion angles and, and, and other metrics that we characterize model with, and see how they compare with defined libraries, with set libraries. And those libraries come from, from different sources. They can come from um, quantum chemical, very accurate quantum chemical calculations. They come from, it's a mixture. They come from um, very, high quality small molecule crystallography structures or very high quality even protein structures. It's a, it's a compilation of knowledge about covalent geometry of proteins stored in libraries such as monomer library or geostandard in Phoenix. And given a structure that you provide us, we can tell how the structure compares to these libraries. So we can calculate root mean square deviations for bonds, angles, and other parameters of your structure. Pretty obvious. Um, speaking of proteins, 
particularly uh, amino acid side chain rotomers, uh, you know, we realized that uh, they're flexible, they're very flexible, and they can adopt a lot of conformations based on the torsion chi angles. So we basically can just, you know, in this phenyl alanine example, we have two chi angles that we can rotate the ring about, and that generates a lot of conformations. But it turns out they're not all chemically and physically possible because some of them generate clashes. And that means not all of them are actually possible, again, physically and chemically. So that gives rise to preferred conformations as shown here for another residue. So not all of them are possible, but clusters around some mean positions that are plausible physically can exist. So how we can use this information? Well, we can actually use, take all the very, very good structures that we manually curate, and that's what Richardson's at Duke University did in, in more probity effort. So you can take all these residues, all the structures, look at all the residues and compile the database of preferred conformations for each residue. And that, that gives rise to database of preferred conformations for all residues, which I show here as an example. So you can show them very similarly to, for, for example, on a channel plot. So it shows chi angles for our preferred conformations of all amino acid residues. And you can use this database to compare your given structure against the database and see where you are. And if particular residue doesn't really match one of this, um, all these plots, we can say something about it. For example, we can say it's unlikely because we've seen thousand structures having that conformation and your residue really doesn't obey that. So it's quite unusual. So that can be used for validation and that's how we decide about um, amino acid rotomer outliers using databases like this. Um, that's available in Phoenix again. Um, if you run comprehensive validation, that's something I mentioned in the beginning, you can get score for each residue and you can actually see all by going here view chi plots you can actually see all these plots that i showed in previous slides and for each particular residue you can see why that residue is on that plot so that's a good thing to keep in mind now a very important point an outlier does not necessarily mean wrong so all these metrics are kind of statistical metrics derived from looking at many structures and saying lots of structures have this particular conformation. But it doesn't mean that a few structures that don't adopt this conformation are actually wrong. So um, it's very important to keep in mind an outlier does not necessarily mean wrong. But if you have an outlier, which means it's a very unlikely entity, you need to be able to explain it. And most of the time, the only way you can explain it is actually use your data, right? So in this particular case, um, this particular example, unfortunately, I don't have a PDB code on this slide, but that's, that's derived from real data. You know, you, this residue, this residue would be flagged as a rotomy outlier, but it has perfect density. It really fits them up very well, and it makes, you know, makes chemical sense by making all this uh, hydrogen bond network. And if you look what's the nearest valid rotomer, it's not too far away. So really, uh, that residue adopts uh, an outlier conformation because it's forced to do so to make all this um, hydrogen bond network. So that's an example showing that something can be flagged as outlier, but that not necessarily means that out that particular outlier is wrong. Now, that's all good for uh, high-resolution data when you can um, 
when we have if you have an outlier, you can actually look at the data and try to justify it. But at low resolution, like in this example, um, it becomes trickier. It becomes much trickier. Right. So um, the lower the resolution, the less density you see for for side chains. And when we do refinement. By the definition of refinement procedure, the side, the side chain will be looking for for nearest map to fit, and if it's lacking its proper density for that side chain, it will see. Oh, I have a very very strong density, which is a main chain density, and turns out it will be trying to fit that density. That would happen all the time, and that's exactly the reason why you get more rotomer outliers when you do refinements at uh, at low resolution. So again, at low resolution side chains would have much weaker or even non-existent density, but you will be having some main chain density anyway. And the side chains would all be trying to uh, fit this uh, main chain density. So we try our best in refinement procedures to apply rotomer specific restraints on side chains so that doesn't happen but if that happens that's the explanation and that's another reason why it's important to use uh, specific rotomer restraints at low resolution which we talked about uh, in, in previous talk about refinement well we know on um, clashes and there's a clash score term that you uh, here constantly here in, in, in validation context. So what is that? Well, it's pretty simple context. It's basically um, looking at your structure and see what atoms have implausible steric clashes. So what atoms run into each other without making any physically possible interactions. There are lots of details how it's done. It's basically given a structure. You're all a ball of so certain radius on the surface of that structure, and that creates another surface. And if that's two surfaces overlap, you can different based on atom type. You can differentiate whether this plausible overlap, for example, you would wonder was interaction hydrogen bond or whether that um, implausible clash. So that's really a nutshell. You don't have time to go into great details, but that's that's what it is. As I mentioned, there's a way to visualize that um, graphically. You know, this clash score probe dots that uh, mole probability shows you, and we show that in Phoenix as well. This problem is more accurate for uh, low resolution refinements and maps because again, you that resolution you tend to see main chain kind of sausages like densities and those densities act like a magnet to suck in um, side chains and that typically generates clashes. and those densities also are not detailed enough to tell about particular conformation even of, the, of main chain atoms so um, that also possible reason for for clashes as you know, I, I show in this picture. Very important topic in this context is hydrogen atoms. So many non-atomic resolution uh, structures still don't use uh, hydrogen atoms because people's rationale would say, well, that's low resolution. There's no chance I can see hydrogen, so I don't include them. But in fact, hydrogens are there. They are pretty much half of your structure, and they, mo they make most of interatomic contacts. Like I show in this example, on the left, piece of structure without hydrogens, and on the right, piece of structure of the same structure in the same view with hydrogens. So you can see they, they make a lot of context. And if you don't have them in your structure and you have low resolution data, then um, you know non-hydrogen atoms would not be aware hydrogens do exist and non-hydrogen atoms would move around to fit the noisy data, low resolution data, as good as possible without caring that there are hydrogens. 
So the take home message from here is really important to use hydrants all the time in refinements. So because they help to prevent non-physical um, interactions in your, in your structure. And also hydrants are used in validation to, um, to, solve, to solve particular validation topics. For example, NKH flips. Um, that's an example of SN residue in two conformations. And what we see here, there's no, there's no, there's no hydrogens added. So basically at typical resolutions, you can't really tell the difference between um, oxygen and nitrogen, right? So they, they, they're pretty similar in terms of weight and uh, the density peak they, they give rise to. So um, if you don't have hydrogens, you wouldn't be able to tell what is the correct conformation of this ASN residue. But if you add hydrogen, so all of a sudden you realize that one conformation has pretty unplausible clashes and the other one has actually good hydrogen bond network. So that's, that's one of the great examples showing um, that hydrogen is actually important both in validation and model building and refinement procedures. Okay, next topic. Let's move on. Ramachandran plot. Let's talk about Ramachandran plot for a while because that's it's quite complex and important topic. And that's how we um, mostly measure protein main chain, conformation of protein main chain quality. Ramachandran plot is basically speaks for um, main chain torsion angles and those angles can adopt a lot of conformations, but not conformations are possible. So there's a number of facts about Ramachandran plot. And again, going to basics, Ramachandran plot is just a two-dimensional picture showing phi and psi angles. But not all of these angles are possible or plausible, and some are very favorable and some are not. It turns out statistically that most residues in protein structures, like 98% more, cluster around favorite regions here. Some of them can be in less favorite, but still possible, physically possible regions, which are called the large regions. And there are regions that are really physically implausible. Still possible in some very, very exceptional circumstances, but really implausible, and they are called outliers. That's the basics you need to know about Ramachandran plot. Another thing is everybody used to look at just one plot, which is plot for general, but in fact, there are six plots as Richardson's showing in, in one of the papers. And these plots are specific for specific classes of residues, such as glycines and preprolines and transprolines, and cisprolines and, and so on. So strictly speaking, if you are keen to look at a Machado plot, you should be looking at um, all six plots. There are six plots out there. And actually Phoenix, should, generates them all for you. So if you do validation or by the end of any refinement job you run, you get actually all the six plots. It's just by default, I think the software shows you one, which is general plot, but uh, you, can, you can get these six plots as part of validation or any refinement job. Just so keep in mind, that's handy to look at them all. Very, Likewise to uh, Rotomers, the Roma channel plot outlier does not necessarily mean wrong. And here's my, um, one of my favorite examples, which I learned about at uh, West Coast Protein Crystallography meeting a few years back. Uh, that was a uh, Andy Carpus talk, I think. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure where he was showing this example that's a very nice example. So it's real structure, 3NOQ, one action resolution structure from, uh, from available in PDB. It has two residues that, you know, if you run validation, they, 
we would be flagged as outliers sitting in this region. But in fact, they really have very, very good density. So there's chemistry going on there uh, that justifies this outliers. Again, take home message from this. Not everything that flagged as outlier means wrong. So, but if you have an outlier, you need to um, be able to justify that outlier. And most likely, don't, the only way you can justify it is actually experimental data that can support, that can or cannot support that outlier. Moving on, um, as I said, Roma Charon plots is quite a complex topic to um, digest. Um, because they may have different appearances and not all the appearances are easily interpretable. I'll explain what I mean in next few slides. So let's look at these four plots here. So this plot is very good. So everything sits in most preferable favorite confirmations. There is no outlier, but even, even if we had one outlier or two or few, that would be okay because that's what we statistically expect. So but this plot looks good. The other plot is good too, because like I said, you know, we, we might expect outliers and they're fine as long as we can justify them by the data. Now, this plot is obviously wrong, very bad. Pretty much the structure is not very good. We got a lot of outliers, and that's that that that's how we know it's bad. But what about the fourth plot here? So we, here we see, you know, a lot of residues. Pretty much most residues are in favorite uh, spots, favorite regions of the plot. There's no outliers. Looks kind of fine but something isn't really good about this plot. Something is really odd about this plot. What is odd? Example, why all these residues cluster off the most favorite confirmation and systematically avoid this, this area? Why they systematically avoid this area? So technically speaking, that's a great from a channel plot, but there's something particular strange about this plot. And that's what we're going to talk about next few slides from now on. One of the reasons why we get this kind of strange plots, there are real examples for these plots, is that with the rise of low resolution data, which is mostly cryon data, you know, validation metrics become progressively used as refinement goals, right? So if we do low resolution refinement, we are likely to use Roman channel plot restraints, likely to use embedded deviations as restraints. So we use secondary structure restraints, we restrain side chain chi angles and, and so on. Why we do this is because, well, you have a dilemma here. So if you got a low resolution data, you really have to decide whether you want to get more physically and chemically plausible model that fits your data as good as possible by using all the information you have, such as Roman channel plot, which is you know traditionally used as, as validation, or you don't use that validation metrics as your refinement goals, but then you get less plausible, less physically and chemically plausible models. So you have that dilemma. And that's the choice. It turns out most people decide to get a better model and sacrifice validation metrics by using Roman on plot restraints, for example. So as a result of this fact, validation, this kind of validation, this validation metrics become less capable of catching problems. And that's what I mean. I'm going to explain that and a few slides. So here's an example, one of very many examples from the databases. So recently published structure that has perfect statistics, really perfect statistics, low clash score, expected, favorite, no outliers, better deviations and, and such. 
for this resolution, these are very, very good metrics. It's great structure. Good, very, per pretty much perfect metrics. But if you calculate the Ramachandran plot for this structure, it looks very strange. It really doesn't have outliers, but it really look very, it looks very systematic, which is unlikely. Now, um, now how we tell it's unlikely, right? So if you're not very experienced, you may say, well, you, you know, everything fits the favored region. So what's, what's the problem? Why, why we worry? Well, it takes a trained eye to distinguish between what looks good, what looks bad, and what's suspicious. You know, this is an obvious example here that I show. One year zero is those reductase structure I used to work with Alberto Pajani years ago. It's a 0 0.6 action resolution. It's obviously great, and Ramachandran plot is great. So it's good, and picture on the right is, you know, so, so great, lots of outliers. And you can quantify that numerically. So for the picture on the left, you can get a number and say that's, you know, there's so many outliers. There's no outliers actually there. Um, most residues in our favorite regions, all good. Picture on the right, um, you get a lot of outliers. So you don't need to do anything. You don't need to look at this plot. You get uh, so many outliers, so you can pretty much for sure tell there's something problematic about this particular structure. But now look at these examples here. None of them have outrageous outliers. None of them have um, suspiciously low amount of residues in favorite regions. So if you don't look at these plots, but look at just numbers, number of percentage of residues in favorite and allowed regions and outliers, you would say they're all great. They're all perfect in terms of uh, main chain confirmation of a channel plot. But um, there's something old about, about these structures. There's something strange about the structures. Like again, here, everything is clustering around. There's some residues for some strange reasons making a line here. They avoid most probable confirmation. Very similar here, except that there's no line, but residues cluster. If you carefully look, they cluster around the border. Again, avoid for some reason, most probable peak. Very similar picture here, except the difference from the two here, that, that the residue for some reason make a line, vertical line here, and don't align actually in, 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 with, with the region. So clearly for train I, I would say that the three plots are very, very strange, very unlikely. But if you don't, if you don't have a train I, or if you don't look at the plot, how you know there's a problem. So that's the issue. So we really need to have something that we can use to tell, to flag these examples as strange, as, as outliers, as something that, is very unusual. Turns out um, there is a work published very, very long time ago that actually gives us solution here. I don't have time to go into great details, but basically in a nutshell, in this paper, the author described how to calculate a number that describes Ramachandran plot just using single number and can tell, it's really, really simple. It can tell whether your plot is great, it's good, whether it's suspicious, whether it's poor. It's called Ramachandran Z-score. That's what people at PDB do, been calculating and showing for years, but up to now they wouldn't make a big deal about it. So would be just a one number out of 100 numbers they show and that would nobody care about and look at but it turns out that number is extremely powerful and useful to flag 
this unusual Ramachandran plot situations. So um, now we're going back to our examples that we looked at before, and, and now revisit them in terms of these numbers, in terms of Rama Z number. So for the great structure, this Aldo's reductase one year zero, we, know, we have guidelines for this number, by the way, I didn't mention that, but there's a guideline. So that's, that's something you better to remember if you use this metric. So um, that's the guideline, that's what we remember, and that's what we will be using in Phoenix tools from now on very consistently. So um, for, for this example, the number tells us that's the great Ramachandran plot. And for the example on the right, that says, well, it's minus seven, that's the first category, that's poor. But actually, we know it's poor because of the number of outliers. So Rama Z is not very important in this particular example. But going back to our other three examples where number of percentage of outliers of favorite agents wouldn't tell us much about the quality of the plot, the Rama Z actually tells us a lot. So all these plots are quantified as poor, having absolute value of Rama Z greater than three. So with this number, even without looking at these plots, we can tell these are very, very unlikely plots. Great number, isn't it? Now going back to our first example that we started with, we can calculate Rama Z for it and it's minus 3.3, .3, which is greater than three, which tells us it's unusual. It's, it's, not actually, it's not actually unusual, it's poor. It's not even suspicious. So again, this particular example doesn't have any outliers, has majority of residues in favored regions, which is great, but from this statistical viewpoint, Ramazet tells us, well, that's, that's something to, to be worried about. It's a great measure. It's implemented in Phoenix now. We, uh, we submitted uh, a manuscript about it and it's available in um, by archives now. So it's global Ramachandran score uh, paper that we um, finished working on. So it's in reviews. Um, again, I, I don't have time to talk about it in great details, but it's, it's in there. To look at and I reiterate from now on we are using this as one of the major uh, validation metrics which helps us to uh, save time at looking manually at looking at plots and actually spot more uh, problematic examples. It's a great thing, it's very new, I mean it's not very new, it's been published first in 1997 but not really used well since then and we give it a second chance in, in this context. Okay, so we talked about model validation. Just as a matter of summary, so I'm almost done with the, the main star. As a matter of summary, um, we had a lot of questions. So what are the, what are the acceptable or kind of uh, rule of thumb values or thresholds for all the metrics. Um, we will look at, and I'm sure it's a can of worms and it's, there's no 100% agreed, you know, community consensus about um, what are the thresholds for all these values. So I'm sure you can ask 10 people and 10 people get 10 different opinions. Here's what we argue in that uh, paper that I mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, the summary of validation tools we use in Phoenix. You know, so for the covalent bonds and angles, that's kind of what makes sense. For clash score, the lower the better, but zero is actually not the goal. That's the good to realize because clash score doesn't really take into account for example, unusual non-standard bonds, like, for example, 
something covalently, you have a ligand that is covalently bound to your protein. So that means there is a ligand atom very close to protein atom. And that clash evaluation tool has no idea about. So it would flag that interaction as a clash because these two atoms are very close to each other. But in fact, they're actually you know, making a covalent bond, which is not standard. That's why a clash score doesn't know about it. So that's extremely important to keep in mind. So clash score and you know, clash evaluation really is a statistical measure. It works over your whole structure. But if you have non-standard links and bonds in your model, they can qualified for clashes, can be reported as clashes. And you need to be aware that this is not a problem, right? So for Ramachandran plot, um, there are standard um, kind of standard guidelines from all property, which again, all published. I'm not saying anything new here. So um, we have Ramazet now. I don't have it here just for historical reason. I've forgot to put it. So we have a threshold for Ramazet. That's one of the most important now for Ramachandran plot quality uh, metric. Uh, number. In terms of outliers, um, you can have outliers at high resolution and because those outliers can be potentially, can be explained by the data. But at low resolution, it's very unlikely you can explain outliers. So if you have outliers at low resolution, they're very unlikely. So the goal is to have pretty much zero Right, so the zero is the goal at low resolution for Ramachandran plot outliers. Very similar for Rotomer outliers. At high resolution, potentially, if there's an outlier, you can explain it by the data or you can fix it using the data at, at high resolution, right? So at low resolution, chances are you can explain Rotomer outlier very, very low, very low. So, um, Again, the goal is to have no outliers at low resolution. Same with better deviations. Global and local, right? So all these metrics, um, and that's, that's kind of implicitly uh, said in the, throughout this talk. Um, so all these metrics are kind of global summaries, right? So the class score is one number, the number of rotom outliers is one number. But what if you have millions of atoms in just one? outlier, that one number is not going to catch that outlier. So when you do validation, and this is something I didn't put much uh, attention to, you get all these numbers and you make all these numbers sure that they are correct and match your um, expectation. But it's extremely important that you also look locally. And that's what I mean here, global and local. So you get the global metrics, which are all right, great and important to look at. That's easy to report in table one, for example, but they have a potential to hide local problems. And that's exactly why you need actually to get um, and look at local properties at residue, chain or atom levels. That's, there are tools to do this. Towards the end, that's all the resources we have in, um, in Phoenix. I showed it before, just for the sake of completeness, com completeness I showed again, uh, there's a Phoenix paper, video tutorials, documentation, rel relevant papers and newsletters and versions of this or other talks as well. Um, lots of documentation specifically for CryEM. It's available here for crystallography is available too. Support, I mentioned software, right? So I'm, I'm expecting to say whether we provide support for the software. Yes, for sure. There's a way to communicate to us, ask questions, report bugs, ask for, ask for help, all these um, channels to do so. Mentioned it before in previous talk as well. So if you have a problem, you report the problem please tell us what the problem is and let us reproduce the problem by sending us all the information, including input files, 
that we can reproduce the problem, see what causes it, fix it, and hopefully produce the next version of the software that doesn't have that problem. With this, I finish and I'm happy to take your questions. Great. Thank you very much, Pavel. So uh, we have a few questions in the chat since you're already in the support and the, uh, the Phoenix page. Uh, are these slides available on your, um, on the Phoenix online page? Um, in some form, so not exactly this set of slides, because this set of slides I've been working on last night on <laughs> for this presentation, but one way or another, they, they are all available in, uh, in presentations in uh, Phoenix page, and I believe you will, you record and will make it available as, you know, as, as, as video to your website, I think. That is right, yeah, so great. So a uh, question from Pete um, in the group here. Uh, question from who, sorry? So I've got a question here from uh, from Pete Meyer in our group. He sent mm -hmm. it by chat. The um, it's uh, sort of hydrogen is in low resolution. Um, sort of the should they be treated as writing hydrogens or should you model them explicitly uh, and include them in the final model? Yeah, no, that's that's excellent questions. Um, yeah, they 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 modeled as writing, and actually, software doesn't really give you a chance to model them as individual. So um, in X-ray case, if you have ultra high resolution data, you, you, have, you have an option to model hydrogens as individual, but most of the times software just implies they're writing and they, they, they're used as writing. So yeah, they're, they're writing by default pretty much in most cases. So this is a question that uh, you know, comes up from time to time I see in the you know, in the BB, yeah. Side chains with uh, no density. So model them as an acceptable rotomer, don't model them. What's your approach? Yeah, no, <laughs> that's, that's one of the questions that pops up on mailing list, uh, mailing lists every, you know, every, every so often. And if you follow that, you would know that there is no community consensus on, on this. So there is no, there is no really general answer. I can just just talk about it, and, and maybe maybe that leads to to some discussion. So I mean, you can chop that side chain off. So say you have an arginine that doesn't have a density. You really don't see any hint of density for it. Well, you can chop it off, and that's that's fine. But what you end up having, you have a model with an entity, a residue in it, that is called arginine. But if somebody looks at it, you know, downloads your file and looks at it, says, is it an arginine? No, it's missing a side chain, it's wrong. Somebody will file a bug report right away to the database, right? So that's, I mean, I'm generating, but that's what I'm saying. If you, what happens potentially if you chop off that side chain, so that's, doesn't look as a good solution, chopping off, right? Okay, well, if you keep it, okay, well, you keep it. There's no data, there's no map there. I download your structure, your, your data. I look at both and say, eh, why you place it there? There's no data there. It's wrong. So it's not a problem. Very similar to the first one. Um, and that's exactly why, that shows exactly why, 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 there is no, why there is no consensus because there's two conflicting extremes of doing, of handling the situation. They are both valid in a sense, but they both can lead to, you know, to very, very severe confusion. Now, if you have that residue, you know, by the sequence, so the sequence dictates that that residue really is there, it's just, you know, you're unfortunate to not see any data to support any particular confirmation of that residue. Well, maybe the way forward, it's not implemented anywhere. It's just a, you know, random soul speaking out loud. Maybe a way forward just to, you know, generate an ensemble of plausible confirmations that make a uh, chemical sense in terms of interactions with neighbors and flag it some, somehow. 
that's kind of again that's not implemented that's just a thought and suggestion to the community but my, my real answer to this is there's no answer really yeah we don't have the tools right we can't uh, we don't have tools right we really we don't have tools it, you know, it's ongoing it's really ongoing so this discussion is really ongoing and hopefully you know one day we have a consensus and we do something systematic and uniform across all all tools we have but there's no clear answer at this point so um the the rama z the rama z that you were referring to is that implemented uh for cryo em in phoenix yeah that's implemented in phoenix that's available for everything in whatever whatever you have it's not specific for cryo em or crystallography so anytime you have an atomic model you can calculate rama z and um it's every time you run validation or refinement or anything to do with the model you get that rama z number so um it's from now on it's uniformly available every everywhere in phoenix so one uh just a follow-up is the um this is probably me asking pete's question badly uh so the question was about uh hydrogens whether mm -hmm. or not the model should be deposited with the hydrogens present or uh, at sort of low resolution or just refined with this uh writing hydrogen parameter Oh, that goes back. That goes back to my very first slide. So, <laughs> so if you if you do refine your structure with hydrogens, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm really you keep them because by deleting them, you modify your structure before deposition, and that's one of the items, not to do items from my list in the beginning, that you should really not do. For your structure so if you do use hydrogens only when refinement and, and validation not not you keep them because otherwise if you delete them you invalidate all the statistics you show for your structure so um really you do keep hydrogens if you choose to use them in refinement which is a good thing in general then you keep them all the way because otherwise if you delete them prior to deposition you need to rerun all your statistics calculation and maybe refinement just to make sure you get all the numbers correctly that account the fact that you don't have hydrogens anymore. So is there yeah. a resolution at which you would not uh you would not use hydrogens? No. Uh if you use them, you use them, right? So at, at high resolution you use them because data supports them, at low resolution you use them because they are present, so that's your a priori knowledge. It's like uh, repulsion restraints and refinement that you still use, you just don't realize that very much because they, they, they're done by software and it's hidden away from you. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's that knowledge that is there. So if you use them, you use them. There's a question from uh, Rakesh. The lubricants sometimes have unclear density for all chains. Uh, is there a way to understand them during validation rather than uh, rather can that be used for improving the model? Sorry, I didn't get the question. So what what has oh. unclear density? I'm sorry. Loop regions. Loop regions. Oh, okay. Well, unclear density. And so um, uh, is there a way to understand that in the validation that they're loop regions that have unclear density? Uh, um yeah well validation will tell that that particular loop doesn't have a clear density that's what validation is going to tell you but it's not going to tell you how to solve this problem so um it will flag it but won't tell you how to solve it so i guess the, the answer to this is no maybe because it's up to you as a, as a researcher to to solve it here's a question the um the Kablam statistics uh, in Phoenix. The, uh, can you talk a little bit about what that is? So Kablam statistics is is, is very new uh, tool to um, basically it's it's kind of a better version of Ramachandran, except that um, it doesn't really tell you exactly how you need to fix your problem, and that's my problem with Kablam validation. So it's becoming more and more mainstream. It's being reported and uh, used uh, quite you know wide these days and it's very useful so it actually does flag uh, particular problems with your main chain the reason i'm not a big fan of it at this point i may become a fan later 
but why I'm not a big fan at this point because it doesn't tell you how to fix the problem. So basically you can run a Kablam validation. You get a lot of Kablam outliers, for example, but you may have no, absolutely no idea whatsoever how to fix them. And I call this a problem. So, um, yeah, you know, that, that's how much I can, I can tell about Kablam. It's very useful. It's, it's really an alternative to Ramachandran plot because this is something you cannot use as Ramachandran restraints. So we don't have restraints on Kablam. So it's truly independent in a way. And, but you really can't, you know, you know, keep that in mind. So if you get an outlier in Kablam space, you, you probably are not going to know much about how you fix that outlier. So that's, 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 that's my problem with Kablam outliers. So here's a question. Um, is it possible to include only certain, uh, certain amino acids with uh, rotomer restraints for certain amino acids? Sorry, I'm murdering the question. The, um, so I, I, my thinking, uh, you know, maybe with this question is you might have some intermediate range where you know, amino acids that have a lot of rotomers, you might want to have some restraints, but um, those that only have a handful do fine. Uh, is that something that would be worth implementing or able to do? Yeah, that's, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's not, a, just to be clear, it's not available at this point. So at this point, really refining software uh, would take a, take a side chain, find the best possible fit to the density on the constraint that the side chain doesn't clash to anything, you know, in, in a neighborhood. And I say, well, that's, that's the best I can do. And let's preserve that in refinement. So it will find that best fit and apply restraints to the current stage and carry that through refinement until next time you refit that side chain. Mm. So if you have multiple versions of that side chain, so if there are multiple confirmations or, you know, you're not sure, that's something really worth investigating. And I, I guess that that will come at some point, but it's not really done or investigated any length at this point. No. Great. Well, with that, um, we'll wrap up. Pavel, thank you very much for a, a great talk. And uh, I know I'd never uh, really dug much into the Rama Z, Rama Z parameter before. That's something, that's something new to me. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, and for everybody online, be sure to join in on Friday. Catch us for uh, Daniel Panna. Uh, it's going to be a good talk. And, uh, Thanks very much for your attention. That was a great pleasure to talk to you guys. That's great. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.